Hello and welcome to the Regulatory Rapporteur podcast. I'm your host today, Alan Booth, Managing Editor of Regulatory Rapporteur. This is the first ever episode of the journal's new podcast series, and I am so pleased you're listening. Topra's monthly peer-reviewed journal, Regulatory Rapporteur, has recently undergone a digital transformation, adding multimedia resources, and this podcast series has been started to supplement the online delivery of the journal itself, delve deeper behind the writing of the journal's articles, and discuss the process of commissioning, writing, and review with its issue editors. And more broadly, where this month's subject fits into the current landscape of regulatory affairs as a whole. Our first two episodes will cover the April issue of 2023, our first 100% digital issue, and today I will be discussing the main focus topic of Latin America with issue editor Vicky Goff, Head of Marketed Products and Regulatory CMC at Munda Pharma in the UK. Hello, Vicky. Hi, Alan. Hi, everyone. Very excited to be part of our first podcast for the Regulatory Rapporteur. Thank you. So, Vicky, um, please can you tell our listeners about bringing the Latin America issue of the journal together and we can look at each of the uh, focus articles in turn. So um, first up is from Brazil and is titled The Transition Period of the New API Framework in Brazil is Coming to an End. So this article discusses the transition period of the new API regulatory framework in Brazil, which comes to an end on the 1st of August this year. This new model brings many benefits for Brazil and changes the way API manufacturers and Anvisa interact with each other. The new framework introduces us to the DFA, which is the drug master file we are all familiar with from other markets, plus administrative documentation required by Anvisa. This article provides an excellent overview of the key regulatory change in the Brazil market. Okay, that's great. Um, Moving on, next up is registration and post-approval variation of pharmaceutical drugs in Latin America. Um, Now, I remember from reading this that um, it's a very very different framework there um, that we're used to um, in the EU and, uh, and the US. Yes, correct. Absolutely. Um, And this article focuses in on that post-approval activity and the challenges that we see in a number of different LATAM markets. It provides a good summary of the key regulatory requirements. And this is a good reference document, I think, for our readers. I mean, it also presents the opportunities for harmonisation and presents the key challenges that people experience within these markets when doing post-approval change. It also expands out to cover topics such as GMP and local testing requirements, which are also more unique in some of these markets. Um, Just as an aside, do you know if um, there are moves for convergence and harmonisation sort of taking place within and between the countries in Latin America? So there are definitely a lot of activities within Brazil, uh, for example, who have recently, relatively recently become part of ICH um, and are looking to harmonise more of their guidelines with with ICH and into the EU and and US markets. I think this is always a topic that regulators are always working on and looking at, but it it just takes time to get implemented. And do you know whether there there would be... um moves to harmonise more with the US framework rather than with the EU, I guess, because that's the sphere of influence of the FDA? That's an interesting question. I think it depends on how the market operates currently. So the in the US, we have more of the annual reporting style for post-approval, whereas in the EU, we have our, our EU variation guideline, um, which requires submissions for most changes. So I think it depends on whether the market aligns more closely with that annual reporting style. Um, So in Brazil, for example, they do use the the annual reporting um, or whether they align more with the one by one submissions like we do in the EU. Okay, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, Okay, and our final Latin America topic article is an overview of the regulatory framework for advanced therapies. So what's going on there? So this article focuses in 
on advanced therapies and it looks at much newer regulations that are emerging in this area, uh, particularly for LATAM, but also for the EU and US markets. It provides a full overview, so all the way from product manufacturing through into your clinical trials, your initial registration and then all of the activities for lifecycle maintenance. And it really highlights that the regulatory framework is in the process of being developed in these markets for advanced therapies, but it really needs further engagement and further development, not just in LATAM America, but across the globe as well. Okay, thank you. Um, and we should also note that we have an interview with Yanath Giha, who is the Executive President of Phi Pharma in Colombia. Um, but please, can I just say quickly, thank you for joining me today. Um, it's uh, very good of you to do this. No problem. Thank you very much, Alan. And I'd like to take the opportunity to say thank you to all of our authors who contributed to the LATAM issue. Thank you, Vicky. It's been great to speak to you. Coming up, we will hear from authors Priti Shah and Anna Litsu, both of AstraZeneca in Cambridge, who will be discussing their article, Does Sole Dependence on Reliance Models Contribute to a Sustainable Healthcare Ecosystem? The Topra Symposium is Europe's premier conference for healthcare regulatory affairs. This year's symposium is going to be held in the beautiful city of Lisbon, Portugal from the 23rd to the 25th of October. The symposium's programme will cover a wide range of topics under its usual framework of human and veterinary medicines, medical devices and IBDs. We will also be holding a support day specifically for small to medium enterprises. It promises to be another fantastic event and we can't wait to see you all in Lisbon. Please go over to www.topra.org forward slash symposium to book and for further information. And don't forget that you can take advantage of the early bird discount rate up until June the 2nd. Hello again to the RegRap pod. I am fortunate to be joined by the authors of one of our standalone features in April's issue, which is entitled, Does Sole Dependence on Reliance Models Contribute to a Sustainable Healthcare Ecosystem? Therefore, I am pleased to welcome to the show lead author Priti Shah, who is Executive Director of International Regulatory Strategy at AstraZeneca in Cambridge, and fellow author Anna Litsu, Director of Policy and Intelligence within International Regulatory Strategy, also of AstraZeneca in Cambridge. Welcome, Priti and Anna, and thank you so much for joining us here on the RegRap pod. Hi, uh, hi, Alan. It's great to join, and uh, we're really excited to be part of the first podcast series for Reg- Regulatory Rapporteur. Thank you. Uh, Hi, Alan. This is Anna. Thank you very much for this opportunity and breaking the frontier being the first first digital um, issue. I'd like to take the opportunity to thank you on behalf of Regulatory Rapporteur and its readers to thank you in person for your article. It was an interesting and thought-provoking read and made me reconsider the challenges and lessons brought into our collective consciousness so sharply by the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we go on to discuss those lessons and what they mean for Alliance models in more detail, please can we first recap on AstraZeneca's role alongside the Oxford University team in bringing the world's first vaccine, Vaxevria, to market in order to combat the threat of the novel coronavirus. It's a phenomenally interesting story in our recent history that you and your company played central roles in solving literally existential problems. Priti, please can I turn to you first to discuss your company's experience at what was the bleeding edge of innovation? Yeah, thanks, Alan. So um, AstraZeneca signed the agreement with the University of Oxford in April 2020, um, and that was for global development and distribution of the the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, which we called uh, the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. The collaboration aimed to bring Uh, to patients the potential vaccine under that agreement and AstraZeneca would be responsible for the development and worldwide manufacturing and distribution of the vaccine. So from April 2020 we started collaborating with Oxford on rolling out the vaccines. They had already started collaborating with the MHRA um, on the clinical trial program and design and importantly the, the DGCI in India as well. So when we entered into the collaboration, we reviewed, assessed and started working with regulators all around the world. We started the rolling review in September 2020 with our first approval at the end of uh, end of December 2020. And within nine months of the collaboration being signed, we had we had actually got our first approval. 
our aim was to get the vaccine registered as quickly as possible simultaneously in all markets. And we did this with out of the box thinking and innovative way, ways of working. We worked very closely with both regulators and governments. Um, and we filed the same global package to uh, regulators all around the world so that all of the authorities had the same information at the same time and could collaborate and work together to assess the quality, safety and effectiveness of the product. The data was filed um, on a rolling basis from September. Uh, and this did complicate things a little bit because it, different authorities were at different stages of review, but we wanted to submit the data as quickly as possible. Um, we actually filed in uh, as many countries as we could in parallel, including the WHO, which facilitated access via the COVAX consortium. So this resulted in 126 licenses. Um, you know, a high proportion of those were, were, you know, we obtained within six months. Um, and for the low and middle income com countries that were designed to, that were going to be supplied by COVAX, we actually worked with WHO and used their platform for submission. So that meant we had one dossier which was made available um, to all low and middle income countries, including questions, responses, assessment reports. And so we didn't have to file separate applications and 100 plus markets to support that COVAX supply. So it was really through great collaboration with regulatory authorities around the world, WHO and governments, we made great strides in the regulatory process, making Vaxavia actually our quickest filing in AstraZeneca. Um, you know, we, we worked really hard with all health authorities around the world, and we had over 200 health authority meetings with authorities around the world that ordinarily we would not have had direct interaction with. Um, and this is really this close collaboration, explaining our data package, explaining how we developed the product and the true partnership that we had and flexibility from from both sides is what really helped us to achieve what we thought was impossible, but became possible. Um, mm. And we're hoping that some of those so some of those sort of ways of working can can be put forward for the future. Um just wondering, did you face the normal sort of practical questions about um, translating into local language for, um, for, for, you know, various authorities that don't use English? No. So that was one of the agilities that we worked with the authorities on. So we the same dossier was submitted in English um, to everywhere around the world. And, and with respect to language, you know, um, we had what we called an, a, an e-label at EPI. So we had a QR code on the pack. So we had a one pack strategy as well. So we only had one pack that went all around the world with a QR code on it. And the QR code took you to a website where you clicked on your country and you could get, you know, your prescribing information in that language. So it was the first product we, we've done this for. Um, and really that helped um, supply flexibility because it meant that you didn't, you know, your pack that you had could go to wherever it was needed in a very short time space of time versus having a country specific pack that could only go to a certain country. So we, as I said, we tried completely out of the box thinking new ways of working. So, so you know, to help both regulators, um, you know, the, the the public at the time, you know, everyone wanted the vaccine, um, but, but you know, us as industry as well, you know, we worked, you know, in an agile manner and, and some of those flexibilities is, is really, you know, showed us the way and has probably accelerated um, the, the regulatory transformation that we need. It's hard to imagine, but I'm wondering now, did you have any pushback from any authorities, you know, saying that this, what you were providing wasn't good enough? Um, so we, we, yeah, we did have pushback, um, but we explained, we, we sort of explained the package, we explained what data we were going to have when, um, we explained why we felt from a scientific perspective it was, um, you know, it, it was robust and, and, you know, we explained our rationale for that decision making. We also had, you know, um, authorities around the world. So, you know, the EMA, WHO helping us as well in, in that conversation. So we had sort of authorities talking to each other, MHRA as well, actually talking to other authorities for us. And, you know, um, 
via the World Bank as well. You know, we had the TGA helping, you know, our, the Thai, Thailand regulators on a, on assessing dossiers. Um, and even though the FDA never registered, you know, our, our vaccine and we, we didn't actually register our vaccine um, in the US, um, the FDA actually helped us with some of this, you know, with respect to donations as well. So, you know, what we saw was this huge, you know, the huge collaboration across governments, authorities, industry, um, which, you know, really helped us achieve what we thought was impossible. And I think that's the sort of collaboration, you know, we we would encourage in the future. And, you know, I think it makes the world a much smaller place. So you can you can see you can see in light, you know, the one global dossier, you know, authorities working together. You, you know, we actually saw it in practice with with that area. Yes, a smaller and safer place. Um, OK, do you think it was a significant factor of regulators that Vaxivria was developed from a pre-existing and therefore trusted technology, um, the viral vector model um, first used in the 70s? I think initially it was a factor for regulators that the platform had been used before. But honestly, the you know, the totality of the data with respect to the quality, safety and efficacy was assessed um, and, you know, assessed in line with the benefit risk profile of, of um, Vaxevia. The new technology mRNA vaccines um, were also assessed based on the, exactly the same standards. But but obviously the science was new. Um, but really, you know, the difference. So, so I would say, you know, it was the the approvals and the assessment was based on the totality of the data, and and you know, like any other product, was was based upon um, review of quality, safety, and efficacy, and the risk benefit profile. But I think the use profile of the vaccine, um, you know, varied quite significantly across the countries. So, you know, we had Europe, you know, uh, uh, who 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 sort of preferred to use the mRNA vaccine versus the low and middle income countries, which used, you know, Vaxevia was used, um, you know, initially as, as, as the main vaccine. And that was due to a variety of factors, major ones, however, being supply and availability of supply. So that was the big issue at the time is, is who can supply the vaccine? How many, how many doses can we supply? And, you know, how much of the population can we vaccinate? Yeah, and also Alan to add, you know, because also uh, the technology was much more established, it it raises a bit more or less challenges in terms of intellectual property. Also, mm. can you know you can transfer the technology like very much uh, very similar, and then you create these uh, regional local capabilities uh, that and and allows faster production uh, and uh, supply. Uh, so sometimes some of the kind of more older, more established, uh, you know, enables, you know, much, much more low income, medium income countries to, uh, you know, uh, stand on their own two feet because they have lower barrier in terms of intellectual property and they're less complicated. So, yes. I and also thinking about um, low and middle income countries as well, um, your products um, didn't require special refrigeration. Um, as the mRNA products did as well, so um, a lot easier to move around. And that brings today's RegRap pod to a close. My extended conversation with Priti and Anna goes into much more detail and will be running as a full-length interview and a dedicated podcast, which will be posted to the RegRap site in just a couple of weeks' time. Thank you for listening to the RegRap pod. We hope that we've brought you more insight into the journal's development and that we've given a worthwhile peek behind the curtain to meet the editors and authors and bring further understanding of the articles and content. Many thanks again to our guests for joining us on this edition of the podcast. This episode was presented by the journal's managing editor, Alan Booth, and produced and engineered by me, Daisy Edwards, from Topra HQ in London. If you would like to advertise with us, please contact Eric Smith at eric at topra.org. And if you have any other inquiries, please email me at daisy at topra.org. We look forward to welcoming you next time when we will be discussing advanced therapy medicinal products with May's issue editor, Harriet Edwards. Until then, goodbye for now.